Good morning, and welcome to the museum. I'm Gene Polisinski. We're here in the museum's uh, New York Times Oak Sulzberger Family Great Hall of News at a very historic moment. We're watching a spacewalk live from the International Space Station, and we have a very special guest who can tell us what's going on at this very moment, Dr. Tom Marshburn, who is the last American to be on the station, walk in space, and his return to Earth came back in May. So, Dr. Marshburn, tell us what's going on right now. Hey, good morning. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the crew that's coming out to do the spacewalk, they started a little early. I did uh, my spacewalk just a little over two months with one of these gentlemen, Chris Cassidy. Who you see on the screen there, though, is the very first uh, Italian to ever do a spacewalk. That's Luca Parmitano. Uh, he just came out of the hatch. They're ahead of schedule a little bit. Those guys are, are hard chargers, so I'm not in the least bit surprised that they've come out early. This is Luca's second spacewalk. Uh, every time you do a spacewalk, your eyes are just wide open. It is spectacular. As you can tell, though, it's, it's nighttime right now. You see the blackness of space there. The, uh, the space station has that kind of golden glow to it. That's the uh, lights that are on the space station uh, that are lighting it up. Sometimes you'll start to see it get brighter, and you will see that in a little bit. I don't know when sunrise is going to be, but that's when sunrise is when the crew can see the Earth and all of its glory and its beauty and its absolutely breathtaking, especially with that big helmet on. Get the best view you can possibly get uh, while you're out there in the uh, vacuum of space. Very hard to keep concentrating on your work. But they've been training for years for these two spacewalks, so uh, they're, they're focused on the job. Luca, uh, what he's doing right now, you can see a couple of bags that have come out the hatch. He, the first thing he did was one of the most important things you can do in a spacewalk, and that is to attach your safety tether. Uh, this is a, a tether, it's a long braided steel cable, it's about 85 feet long, it hooks up to something that's kind of like a fishing reel next to your body. And he has just hooked that up, that is your attachment to the space station. It's not a space shuttle. If somebody comes loose and floats free into the vacuum of space, they're an orbiting satellite and they will die. So there is, because there's no way to go get them. We do have jet packs that we can turn around and fly back if for some reason everything messed up. But that's a little bit dicey. Nobody wants to get in that position. But uh, the jet pack is our last uh, ditch effort to get uh, to save our own lives if we come free of the space station. But that safety tether, uh, will keep you attached, and so that's why it's so important. And Luca had the job of attaching those. You can see Chris Cassidy's feet as he's coming out. So they're talking to each other right now. They're checking those safety tethers to make sure every connection. It's just like if, if there are any rock climbers out there, it's just like rock climbing. You check every carabiner, every uh, knot in your rope to make sure that if you let go, that you won't fall. In this case, if you let go, you won't float away. They also have a couple of big bags. Those bags probably weigh anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds on Earth, maybe even a little bit more than that. You can feel the mass of them. They're weightless in space, but you can feel their mass. And so it's a little bit hard to push and a little bit hard to stop moving, but they're really not hard. You just use a finger uh, to move them around. But they, you attach them to a big, uh, call it a body restraint tether. It's just a ball stack, uh, a big, thick uh, tube, really. It's um, something you can tighten down into a rigid uh, bar to hold on to something. And uh, Luca, it looks like Luca attached one of those to, to his side. One of them did. They've got another bag there they pulled out, getting ready to, uh, so basically they're packing their bags, getting their suits ready to uh, leave the airlock there and then go off onto the space station, climb around on the outside and, and go to work. It's just remarkable. Chris Cassidy will be in the suit, I guess, with red stripes and uh, Luca Pomitano on uh, with a, a pure white uh, yeah, uh, Typically, suit. that's what we do, right. And um, now what's unique about what's just happened is that Luca came out first. Typically, EV-1, which is the most experienced uh, spacewalker, who will have the red stripes. We can't see their faces, so we need a way to identify them. Come, usually, EV-1 comes out first. Chris probably told Luca, I want you to go out first so you can get the experience of opening the hatch. Uh, make sure you get used to doing it. In other words, he had the confidence of Luca to do it the confidence to set up the anchors and suspected that maybe Luca will someday do another spacewalk. So uh, Luca came out first, at least according to the timeline, and uh, they're there. Looks like they're already starting to move out to their, their respective work sites. Up, How uh, high are they the above the Earth? Edge. They're 250 miles above the Earth right now. They're traveling along at uh, 17,500 miles an hour, way above the Earth's atmosphere. Well, we'd like to welcome our, our NASA television audience as well, and also 51 scholars who were part of the 2013 Al Newharth uh, free Spirit and Journalism Conference, and we're glad to have you here and joining us for this very historic moment from here at the museum. 
Uh, when, when you're out, the first thing you do is you, you get set, you're saying check everything. How do you move to where you're going to do? They're going to do a series of repairs and installations at this point, is that uh, the walk? That's right, yeah. Uh, we're going to be doing that, a lot of, a lot of cable attachments, uh, getting set up for continued building of the space station. We call it a spacewalk, or really it's a space crawl. They use their hands to move about. Their space station is covered in handrails, and they use their hands on the handrails uh, to crawl around on the outside of the space station. Uh, we don't do any jumping from one part to the next. I suppose we could, but uh, we train to not do that because then you get into what I problem I mentioned before of actually letting go of the space station and potentially uh, getting getting pushed off into space. So uh, they're very careful, meticulous, and moving off. You can see on your screen there, off to the left, it looks like a, a bar that they've moved up on. That is the standard translation path. It's actually very exciting because that bar takes you from the cylinder that you see, which is the airlock, up to the main truss right, so, of the space uh, station, which is a football field in length. And uh, I've done my spacewalks out to the end of that. You really feel like you're hanging out up under a cliff with 250 miles below you in the, in the brilliant earth below you. Uh, so that is uh, where they are going right now. And that little bar with little handrails on it, you're just moving out on it. It's actually very exciting. I think I'd be holding on pretty tight. Well, you do. And actually, the, on your first spacewalk, they uh, give a, a brand new spacewalker about 10 minutes to move around a little bit to get used to what it feels like with that 250-pound suit around your body, kind of stiff, and get used to moving around and, and holding on to things with, your, uh, with just your hands, really. Tell us a little bit about you while they're making their way down that rail. How did you come to join NASA and be an astronaut? Yeah, um, I was started off as a physics major and went into engineering, and then I found out I loved medicine. So uh, I decided to go into medicine. Once I fell in love with medicine, I'd always been a big fan of the space program, but discovered that uh, medicine was, was so engrossing and so exciting that I forgot about everything else. It was after I finished my residency in emergency medicine that uh, NASA started a new program where they were taking doctors and making us into flight surgeons. So I uh, became, um, became a flight surgeon for 10 years and applied in for the astronaut corps while I was at the Johnson Space Center and, and got in. Um, one thing I should mention that each astronaut has cameras on, the, on their helmet. And what you see right now is a helmet cam view is what wow. they call it. So engineers and everybody on the ground can see exactly what they're doing with their hands. It's a little bit high up above the eyes. Sometimes the, uh, the camera will bump something or a flap will get in the way of the camera. It doesn't mean that they've hit their visor because that's not exactly what they see. It just means the, the camera itself is getting covered up. And we had a very quick shot of, uh, of uh, I guess, mission control there. Yes. So there, that's Houston at this point? That's right, that's Houston. Uh, very intense time. There is one person on the ground, I didn't see who it was this time, who uh, I believe it's gonna be Shane Kimbrough. He was an astronaut that worked the last spacewalk, who is actually reading step by step through a very detailed timeline. It's 93 pages long. They don't have it with them, although I suspect they've memorized almost the whole thing. Uh, typically we do that to get ready. But he's still reading up the reminders, all the serial Talk numbers, that sort of thing. Head, uh, to them. So everything's strapped in, tied down, so it doesn't float away. Exactly, like yeah, that's uh, the, the big old cobra, we call it. Uh, inside that bag that has a handle on the outside of it is a uh, electrical cable. And it's uh, one that hasn't been brought out yet. They're going to hook that up. I'm not sure which one this is. They've got several they've got to hook up. But it's obviously tied very tightly, tied down, because if they don't do that, it'll start yeah, no to problem. unfurl in zero that, uh, gravity and unwrap. It can wrap around you and wrap your body around something else. So you've got to be very careful about it. Well, we'll go to some questions, actually, very quickly here. You know, it's hard to tear yourself away from what, watching oh, what they're doing. Okay. Especially but uh, if, uh, it, it really is uh, remarkable. We have a large screen here in the museum, which we use for a variety of programs. But we're getting to see this on a pretty big screen. So. Um, and we'll go to our first question. If you can tell us uh, your name and the state you're from, we're going to get some questions from the, uh, the Free Spirit Scholars. Hi, I'm Kenji Endo from Delaware. Um, why do you think that um, adventure, exploration, and being curious is important? Why adventure, exploration, and being curious is important? Um, I'll, and I'll start by saying that was sunrise. What you just saw, oh. 16 sunrises and sunsets a day. Wow. Uh, because we're going so fast around the world, we're around the world 16 times a day, so uh, that's what you what you see. Um, well, I, 
I think it's our human nature. I don't think we can stop doing it. The reason why we have a space station, this building, the ability to communicate using something called electricity and microphones is because we love exploration. So uh, it's a part of the fabric of, of human beings. I don't think we can avoid it. At the, uh, when it comes to space flight, it's a natural extension of who we are, I believe. And whether the, the question is whether we choose to do it today during our lifetimes or whether we choose to do it later in life. Uh, it's important because it improves our lives and it eventually becomes uh, essential to our survival. Someday our planet is going to be unlivable for one reason or another, whether it's uh, a climate change issue or an asteroid or a super volcano. Um, I firmly believe, and a lot of people believe, and if you look for far enough into the future, we will have to leave this planet. And these are just the first little baby steps to do that. Thank you. And le let me say what a privilege it is to talk to you all. Congratulations on, on being here. Uh, and uh, I feel very honored to, to get a chance to answer your question, so I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I'm Kimberly Holiday. I'm from the state of Wyoming. And I know NASA is very selective with their astronaut program, so I'm just wondering how you went about being selected to do something so incredible. Sure, and uh, and I will continue to, to break away. Um, Looking at this, I'm still trying to figure out who that is, if that's Luca or if that's uh, Chris Cassidy there working on that. You're going to see him working with that cable for quite a while as he unrolls that thing. It's it's actually uh, very hard on the hands. Um, working in that space is very tight, so you can see, I can tell you, over time, your forearms start to get tired and your hands start to get tired. It's, they're, they're working pretty hard right now. They're probably even starting to sweat a little bit, maybe, yeah, with their work. One thing it's important to know about becoming an astronaut is that uh, we're going to be seeing a lot of private companies uh, coming up. So for the near future, it continues to be your STEM fields, your scientific, tech, uh, the technical engineering and mathematics. Uh, that become some of the most important fields for people as we continue to learn how to get into space. Um, so going into that kind of a field is important. However, with commercial crew, uh, with the extension of the space station as we go deeper into space, it's, it's all open. Everything, you know, who's going to be the first journalist, the person that actually is up there specifically to, to do the work that a journalist does, to be able to tell the, the ground about what's going on. Um, so, uh, you've, taken, you've all taken the first important step that we tell everyone, and that is to follow your passion, follow your dream. Um, and every astronaut I've ever talked to loved what they did before they became an astronaut. So that's absolutely crucial uh, to becoming an astronaut. But if you're taking care of yourselves physically, doing what you, what you love, what your passion is, and then never giving up trying to become an astronaut, whether it means getting ready in a, with a private company to fly, being able, to, you'll probably be able to buy a ticket to fly. Maybe you'll work for an institution that will buy your ticket to fly so you can report on exactly what's happening. Uh, or applying for the astronaut corps uh, with the government, with NASA. Uh, those are all, I think, going to be options coming up. All right, thank but, you so much. Sure, yeah, but don't give up. I had to apply uh, three times before I got in. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name is Robert Evans and I'm from Texas. So kind of playing off of what you were talking about a little bit earlier, about how you can buy a ticket to space. Um, so up till now, it's been mostly public space, or not public, uh, through uh, government-funded uh, space flight. And now we're turning more to, towards commercial space flight. So in that regard, do you think that, commercial, or do you think that uh, space exploration would be better suited for uh, government-funded uh, institutions or commercially-funded institutions? Um, the way it's, it's happened in the past is that the things that are extremely difficult to do, that an entire nation is required, both the funding and the expertise is required to pull it off, like landing on the moon, building a space shuttle, getting access to low Earth orbit. Um, entire countries have to do it. There's no, uh, there's no market, there's no one person that has enough money to develop the technology to accomplish that. Now that NASA has established that as it's not routine by any means, it's still a very difficult thing to do, but still has the technology to do it, uh, private companies can leverage off of that. They can do it probably faster, better, more efficiently, and uh, continue to develop new, tech to te new technologies to make it even easier to get up there. Um, but it's, it's, it's really a, a marriage between the two. And what NASA has talked about is going beyond low Earth orbit now to asteroids, to the moon, to Mars, capturing an asteroid, doing those things that a company, again, can't, can't do. Lack of funding, lack of expertise, lack of know-how. But as an entire nation or as a group of nations, we can figure it out. And then whatever we find out, 
you know, uh, give that information to private companies, and then they jump on our shoulders and can take over from that. It seems to be a, a wonderful process. This is the first time it's ever happened in the world, so in our human history. So we're, we'll see how it goes. I'm just going to interrupt just a second yeah. to say that uh, we're seeing a little bit more of mission control here. How much of the mission command structure is in Houston? How much of it is really resting on the folks in the station themselves? Because there's there's additional crew in the station right now working with the astronauts outside. That's right. There are four others inside. Uh, Karen Nyberg, the woman with the long blonde hair, she's a PhD in aerospace engineering. She was actually putting their suits on, and now she's uh, getting to work the robotic arm um, and taking care of that. She actually has one of the most difficult jobs right now for this spacewalk. But the command structure is uh, pretty intricate. There is a commander on the space station and then the flight director in mission control and they are in charge of the actual execution of this spacewalk. The flight director is uh, the second gentleman from the bottom of the screen. He's probably handing over to someone, so I don't know who's prime right now. That looks like David Korth, who I believe is the flight director. To his right is Megan MacArthur. She is an astronaut. She flew to repair the Hubble on, its last, on the last Hubble repair mission. She's a robotic arm expert. So she's there to help Karen with the robotic arm. And next to her in the blue shirt is Shane Kimbrough, an astronaut that's done a spacewalk, and he is the, the ground guy that's, that's reading up the steps. When it comes to mission safety, the crew calls the shots because they know what's going on. And they, if they have to take quick action to keep themselves safe and the space station safe. When it comes to execution of the mission and getting the job done, the flight director makes the call. And usually it's a, it's a give and take. They respect each other, uh, they each have different perspectives, and that's uh, pretty critical. One thing I mentioned, this is, so this is Chris Cassidy right now. He is doing some electrical connections, and uh, it sounds pretty easy, you know, you unplug the lamp, stick something else in there, but he is working with cables that have been up there for a long time, and they're incredibly stiff. And from what I heard, he was trying to do this on his last spacewalk last week. And he said it's the hardest thing he's ever tried to do in space. He's a Navy SEAL. He is a huge guy. So if he says it's hard, it's got to be really hard to do. Those things are probably like just solid steel. Uh, the things that he's moving around is probably what it feels like. And every time you push on something, you actually get pushed away. So you have to grab a handrail, pull yourself in, push it in. And so if you've got to use two hands, you've got to figure out a way to restrain yourself so you don't push yourself back. Here's that Being tether exhausting. you were talking about. Yeah, now that's a local tether. So you can actually take your hands off and go to work. You won't fly more than five feet away. Uh, but we train to always have that up there. You, you get graded when you're an astronaut and you're training to do a spacewalk. You get graded on any time you might forget to put that local tether down. <laughs> and and you, can, you can fail as well and have to redo it. So uh, we're highly motivated to always keep track of that. Very good. Question here. Hi, I'm Matthew Callahan from Hawaii. And obviously you guys go through a lot of rigorous training uh, leading up to the spacewalk. So after all this time and preparation, what are your emotions once you're out there and then once the spacewalk's done? Um, it's, uh, I don't know if you've ever done anything, I'm sure you have, something very intense like taking an exam or uh, if, you know, I always revert to rock climbing, something like that. Huge amount of emotion leading up to it. Uh, for a spacewalk, it's like it's a combination of maybe going out on stage for the first time as the lead in a play and Christmas morning uh, when you're a kid. You're incredibly excited, a little bit nervous, but you just can't wait to get out there and get started. Then when the work starts, it's just like training. The training is really good. We train in a huge pool. It's one of the largest in the world. Uh, in our mock-ups there, you've memorized almost every handrail, every hand movement, and you just sink into it. These spacewalks can go six, eight hours, and the time just flies by. It's incredible. You don't even realize you're tired and hungry until you get back inside. So um, the emotion is huge. Up until the time you open the hatch, you see the Earth for the first time, and then you go to work. And then when you come back, uh, you realize what you've accomplished and what the ground has accomplished. You talk about what's happened. Uh, so there's a sense of relief, uh, but also the fatigue sets in. And I think that's when it's uh, most exciting, especially just as before you get in the hatch to come in the last time and you can look down and see the earth below you. Um, you can take a few breaks while you're out there and just get an idea of what's going on. When I uh, uh, did my spacewalk all the way out, I was at the end of the space station and I grabbed the very last handrail at the very end and just held myself out, took a couple of seconds to look down and look back at this entire uh, enormous $100 billion space station that's flying over the Earth that was off on my right hand. And uh, it, it takes your breath away. You, you really, uh, it's hard to, hard, really hard to take it all in. So you download it to your brain and so you can think about it later. <laughs> that is an amazing 
experience, I can only imagine what it must have looked like to see that station there. Yeah, yeah, if stick your hand out and, and spread your fingers apart about, about an inch, and that's how thick the Earth's atmosphere. So you have this beautiful, brilliant white and blue Earth, usually white and blue, and then this thin, neon bright, uh, electric blue atmosphere. It's only about that thick, and the rest is the blackness of space, which is a black that you can't recreate on Earth. It's not the color black. It is the absence of everything. It's a thick, uh, oily, almost palpable um, depth to it, even though it's just black. It seems to, to soak light and soak up light and color into it. So it's actually uh, really grabs your soul when you see the, the blackness of space. Oh, yeah. uh, some data from NASA, 171 spacewalks in, in support of the station's construction and maintenance. Right. Uh, you've logged almost six hours total, I guess, in space, is that, uh, in, in walk? In spacewalks? Uh, no, I've actually done uh, four now. Oh, okay. So um, came out, I think it, I'm not sure what it all adds up to. I think it's, we're up to about 25, 26 hours, something like that. But I'd have to go back and do the math, I'm sorry. Wow. Well, we'll go to another question here. Hi, sir. My name's uh, Riley McGreen from Rhode Island. Um, I was wondering what you see as the future of the uh, U.S. space program with regards to uh, going to the moon and maybe Mars. Do you think a... It's important to set national goals like that, that John F. Kennedy did when he said, we'll go to the moon. And do you think that's important for the nation to get behind that and have huge goals like those? Yeah, I've, as an astronaut, I, I do the mission. That's, a, that's assigned. And uh, um, what I understand is our current uh, uh, plan. We've talked about uh, grabbing an asteroid, bring it back into lunar orbit. We've talked about going to the moon, going to Mars. There's a lot of interest, I know, in the public of doing all of those things. Um, and it's, these projects take a long time. They last longer than an, admin, than an administration. So I, I do believe it's important to, to have the goal and stick to it. Um, and because it will take, you know, it took us uh, from the time we decided to go nine, almost 10 years to, to land on the moon. Uh, I'd love to see us take any one of those goals, particularly the asteroid mission, which is the, the focus right now, uh, depending on, on funding issues. And I think it's a laudable goal. All of these things are incredibly hard to do. I mean, we can just barely do this, really. It's so complicated uh, and so difficult to do. It's a miracle, I think, that we pull it off. Every launch, every landing, every, every spacewalk uh, from someone that's been there and seen everything it takes to do it. So these other endeavors will be risky, uh, be extremely difficult things to do. However, that is what uh, how we get benefit from the space program because you have to develop brand new technologies uh, and brand new processes and the goal is to explore the stars so it's it's highly motivating and it has a lot of benefit for people thank you sir I'd love to see it while we're getting to another question here i want to welcome those of you who joined us on nasa tv we're coming to you live from the uh, new york times oak silk square family great hall of news at the museum in the heart of washington dc and we have a very special guest dr thomas Marshburn, who is the last astronaut to walk in space from the space station, return to Earth. And we're watching live uh, Expedition 36, I believe it is. That's right. Um, That's right. And two astronauts right now outside the station. So there's some of that intricate work you were talking about, I think. is. Yeah, those are electrical cables. Uh, they can get kind of stiff and old um, and kind of hard to manipulate after they've been in, in, in the blackness or the vacuum of space uh, for a while. So they're working hard right now. We have another question. Hi, my name is Basundra Mukherjee, and I'm from Vermont. And I'm just wondering, what's the extent of the training you undergo before? Uh, for example, how long does it go on for? What are the different tasks you have to accomplish, et cetera? For training for, uh, to become, to fly to the space station and, yes. and to do a spacewalk. Uh, once you're assigned to be an astronaut, you Im immediately start training. It's typically a two-year period before they call them astronaut candidates because they have to get through that initial two-year period where you're learning how to fly jets, how to work in the simulators, basic orbital mechanics, everything. So everybody gets up to the same level no matter whether you're a doctor, an engineer, or whatever, to starting off or, or a pilot. After that, after assignment, it's two and a half years of training to get ready to fly to the space station. And typically uh, around 20 hours of spacewalk uh, training in the pool. Uh, it used to be a lot more than that. Okay. I'm actually surprised it's not more. It yeah. sounds like a welcome to the club, bang, you're outside. Yeah. Well, it's, it feels that way sometimes. Um, I did my first spacewalks on the shuttle, and we did seven, at least seven timelined runs in the pool exactly like we were going to do them in space before we did it. And now at the space station, you don't necessarily know what you're going to be doing. Uh, so they train us on just a whole skill set. And typically it's about uh, 
uh, after about the 12th hour of, of working in the pool, they have an idea of what you're going to be able to do, and they can train you beyond that uh, to more tasks. So typically, uh, an astronaut will get 20, 25 hours in the pool uh, of work before they can, uh, excuse me, I'm, I, that's 12 runs in the pool, not hours, but 12 runs. So typically, 12 to 20 runs in the pool to learn all the basic skills you need to be able to do these things. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Next question. Hi, I'm Joe Vigil from Colorado, and I was wondering, um, as a kid, did you ever picture yourself becoming an astronaut? Was like, there's something that inspired you to be an astronaut as a kid? I, I was very fascinated with astronauts and flying in space, but I never thought I could be one. Not, not for a second. I'd say you were crazy at the time if you <laughs> said I'd have a chance to do what I did. So uh, I read a lot, read a lot of adventure stories. Um, I loved, uh, the, I don't know if you've seen the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, but uh, at that time I saw it when it came out and uh, it changed my life in the sense that I became very fascinated with space. But it was when I was in high school, I was an avid reader, started reading about building satellites, uh, communication satellites, and that turned me around to wanting to go into science, engineering, math, because I, I just couldn't believe that people could do that. And, uh, it wasn't until I actually became a professional, became a physician, that I thought, well, maybe I could be an astronaut. Uh, one thing I did do, though, I think it's important for people that want to become astronauts is to, to pick an astronaut that inspires you, check out their career, check out what they did, and uh, you don't have to follow their path. You follow one that's unique to yourself, but just see what they did, what kind of schools they went to, what kind of uh, degrees they got. Um, you've got the advantage of having a whole palette of options by the time you're ready to fly in space, of having private companies that can um, send people up, maybe even buy a ticket. So you'll have a lot more options uh, for flying in space than I did growing up, for sure. I know from getting ready for this, uh, NASA.gov has a lot of that biographical information and information about the program. Okay. So that's a, yeah, a good uh, website to start with, but great. clearly it's all over the web over the last few years. I just mentioned that at the museum we have a number of things related to space flight. In fact, one of our uh, trustees uh, was Alan Shepard, the first American to wow. go into space. Um, and we have almost everything at the museum is the, is the thing. It's not a replica. It's not a reproduction. But I have to admit that we have a satellite. For those of you here in the atrium in the up there, that's not the actual satellite. That was a training model. Everything else is pretty much real, but that one's still up in space. I think that was one of the first broadcast satellites. But uh, Space program has been a part of this nation's history since uh, the 1950s, and really, in terms of theory, even before that. And uh, we have some remarkable examples of the news reports about that here at the museum. But if you want to uh, go ahead with another question, please. Hi, I'm Alexandria Brown from California. And I was just wondering, during the whole process, rather it be training or once you went up there, was it frightening? The bottom as, line yeah, question, I think. The, uh, it probably feels about the same as when you're going to take an exam. You don't want to mess up. <laughs> and so during training, I'm sure astronauts have that feeling uh, that crosses their minds. <laughs> the good thing is that the training team, you're there. You've gotten to that, that point. So the training team uh, wants to make sure you can succeed. So you need to go back and, uh, if, if you ever need to, go back. And they'll, they'll get you the training you need to get to where you need to go. So when you get outside the space station, sure, it crosses your mind. You don't want to mess up. And so you're very focused on what you're doing. Uh, I would not say that there is uh, a fear of, it's a very risky endeavor. I mean, they're in the vacuum of space with just this little spacesuit between them and the vacuum. Um, but it's, it's so much going on that you really just have to trust the engineers that have built your suits and the engineers that are watching that suit and that are checking out all the, uh, the work that you're doing. They're working with electrical connectors. They've, you gotta trust the people on the ground to have stopped the, uh, the flow of current so that you don't shock yourself while you're working with this. And that is so overwhelming that you just don't think about it. You really don't. At the, when you're at that point, yeah, you, you're excited about going out. Uh, you understand the risk. Uh, but it's uh, something you've already accepted long ago. So it's, uh, it's an elephant in the room, but it's, it's way back behind you there. Thank you. you. the work. Thanks. We have another question here. All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Akis McEwen from Mississippi. And I was wondering, what's this, what's this like living on a spacecraft, like in space? Like, can you describe the food? What do y'all do at night? Um, do y'all go to sleep? <laughs> um, and in the future, will it be able, uh, will it be the opportunity for young students to go up there, like for interns and stuff? Well, <laughs> an intern on the space station is an interesting concept. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, good question. Uh, the second part of your question, uh, maybe not anytime real soon, but ultimately, you know, all astronauts would love to see the day when everybody can go. Every major transformation of our ability to travel has occurred in exactly the same way it's happening right now. Huge government entities send out sailing ships or steamships or, or airplanes, and then private companies take over. Really wealthy people can buy tickets on those, and but then it opens it up for everybody else as we develop the technology we need to make it really accessible and much cheaper to go. So I, I feel confident it's going to happen, uh, where students will be going up there as well. Um, life in space is great right now. We're as a spacefaring nation, building on the experience of decades of flying in space. We're good at it. It's like a camping trip. It is. Uh, you can't take a shower. You might not get all the food you want. I, I missed fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, fresh bread. Uh, you can't drink coffee in a cup because you know, it's in a, in a pouch, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, but the food is great, keeps us healthy. Uh, the work, the, the best thing is that the work is meaningful and plentiful. There's a lot to keep you busy. You end up every day tired uh, because of the work in the laboratories. That is our main goal. These spacewalks have to be done every once in a while, but our main job up there is to do research uh, at this national laboratory, which is our space station. Uh, and that actually adds a lot to it. Uh, the time flies, uh, and every day you feel, feel good about what you've done. So um, I think that's, that's one of the things that makes life up there so good. Sleeping and all that is all unique and wonderful, and we've, our bodies are good at adapting to that sort of thing. So life right. is good up there. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. There's another aspect to, to living on the station, and that's the physical impact on you. And as yeah. a physician, talk for a moment about what it's like to spend that much time in space and you know, the, the things that occur to the human body and the things you have to worry about as a flight surgeon? Yeah, sure. The, um, when, as soon as you get up in space, there's a thing called space adaptation syndrome. Your, your, it affects about maybe three out of five astronauts where they, at best, lose their appetite, don't feel, feel a little queasy, and at worst, you get actively sick. Uh, but that only lasts about 12 to 24 hours. And after that time, you're, you're pretty much adapted. You're able to go pretty well. After my shuttle flight, which was 16 days, and my station flight, which was five months, I realized <clears throat> on my station flight that my body really took about a week, about a month to six weeks to adapt. That I was back to completely being normal with my appetite and my sleep schedule and all that after about a month, uh, maybe about six weeks. Uh, one thing that happens to your body, though, that we are concerned about is your bones resorb. You start to turn into jellyfish, sort of. And that is why we exercise so hard so that our muscles will have something to pull against. Just floating in space is more relaxing to your body than sitting in a chair or lying in bed even. Because even now, your bodies are working, your muscles are working to keep, your, keep yourself upright. And you don't even have to do that in space. So that's the bicycle we've seen and some of the that's other right. things. That's right. So two and a half hours a day of exercise on a stationary bike, on a treadmill with bungees that pull you down to keep you on the treadmill. And they have a, this brilliant resistive exercise machine. You can do 600 pounds, I can't, but 600 pound squats. Maybe one of these guys is good. They're, they're both incredible athletes. Um, most astronauts now come back with more lean mass and less fat than when they left uh, because we are so committed to getting exercise while we're up there. If we didn't do that, then we wouldn't be able to do these spacewalks because you wouldn't be strong enough. It has happened in, uh, in the Russian space history that they couldn't close a hatch once. Wow. Once they went out because they, uh, their muscles had atrophied to the point where they were having a hard time. It became a space emergency, and they came around and got in through an alternate way back into their space station. But we want to avoid that happening, so we work out pretty hard while we're out there. And when you get back, how long does it take to adjust when you get back? Um, I haven't adjusted yet. I've been back two months. I feel normal right now, but I think it'll probably take about six months for my bones to get back to normal. Right. Uh, they're, they're still a little bit weak, and not that I can tell. I feel fine. My um, stamina is not quite what it was before I left uh, when I work out, but it only really took a couple of weeks before I wasn't falling over when I tried to walk or, you know, letting go of things in, in the air and expecting them to hover and, and uh, <laughs> falling down to the ground. So, the in the kitchen. You know, yeah, just, this happened. Yeah, my uh, family wouldn't let me have a drink unless it was in a plastic <laughs> sippy cup for a while. <laughs> Uh, for fear that I'd break it. So, well, this is a great view here. Oh, here we go. Yeah. yeah, this is a helmet uh, camera view. Looking back, I think it's looking aft, although we got a lot of static there. That was the, the extension of the uh, Russian segment all the way back to the aft of the space station. We're in, they're in the bright sunlight right now, and you can feel that through your suit. You actually, you have a temperature control 
on your spacesuit is a liquid cooling garment, a mile of tubing that's woven into the underwear of that spacesuit with chilled water running through it. You can control that flow. Um, typically, people leave it in one place so that on the sun side, you just get kind of sweaty, kind of warm, and on the night side, you get a little chilled. But you can definitely feel the temperature changes about uh, 300 degrees on the sunny side, negative 200 degrees on the dark side. So that suit is really protecting you. Wow, that's extraordinary. Another question, please. I'm Donald Putnam, I'm from Maryland. And I was wondering, what are some of the biggest challenges you face in this career, and what makes those challenges worth, over worth overcoming? Uh, the, there's a lot of challenges. One of the main things is, is just grasping so many different fields all at once. We have to learn how to be plumbers, electricians, mechanics, uh, doctors. We, everybody takes first aid. There's always a crew medical officer up there, even if it's not a doctor. Uh, you have to become as best you can a specialist in every area. You're working with people, though, that have a PhD level of ex experience in it. So an astronaut's knowledge is typically an inch deep, but very broad, whereas the specialists are a mile deep and, and a little more narrow. Um, so we have to maintain our breadth, but we try to get as deep as we can. So it's a lifelong study. And I think that's the, the biggest challenge. Uh, one aspect of that that's really challenging is uh, learning Russian. We have to learn Russian in order to fly on the Soyuz spacecraft and fly to the space station and fly on it. Uh, one third of the space station in, in terms of area is our volume is uh, built by the Russians. The, our means to the space station is on the Soyuz spacecraft. We communicate in Russian while we're flying up there. So uh, there's, uh, I think that's probably the biggest challenge. The other challenge is waiting for your flight. <laughs> um, and then another aspect that's interesting is everybody's always watching you. No matter what you're doing, you're, there are people that are evaluating how you work, whether you're working in mission control right now, as a couple of astronauts are doing, or whether you're in a simulator or up in space. So those are all pretty significant challenges, I think. It's worth it, though. It's a lot of fun. For those of you who just joined us, we're coming to you over NASA television from the museum in Washington, D.C., and asking questions right now are members of the 2013 class of the Al Newharth uh, Free Spirit and Journalism Conference who are here this week from all 51 states, and they're asking questions uh, of astronaut Tom Marshburn, who was the last astronaut to walk in space at the space station, returned to Earth in mid-May, and he's here watching things like the schematic of the work that they're doing and some of the live shots from the International Space Station, where there is a six and a half hour spacewalk, I think. I believe that's what's planned, let's see. Yep, it's about six and a half hours Going planned. on now, and those of you who are here in the in the museum are watching on a large on the large screen, which is one of our signature experiences here. Let's have another question. Hi, I'm Max Denning. I'm from Oregon. So, where do you go from here? Obviously, now you've been to space. So, where do you see your career progressing? Do you want to stay with NASA? Do you want to return to space, or do you have other plans? Yeah, most people that go to space want to go back, <laughs> and I'd love to go back. So. Uh, but more importantly, I think um, now that I've been up there, I know I can't go back. There's a lot of people, or at least not right away, there's a lot of people waiting in line to go. People that have never flown in space are waiting in line. So um, I want to help them be successful when they fly in space. And largely, that's what every job of every astronaut is. You could easily spend a year as an astronaut for every day you get to spend in space. And we spend most of the rest of that time, and train about 30% of our time uh, training, and the rest of it, helping other astronauts as they fly in space. It takes that big of an effort to, to make one person successful up there. So uh, I'd like to go back and, and uh, talk about what I've done, uh, talk about what's different up there, help train uh, astronauts as they get ready for their space flights, and just help out uh, any way I can. And that's, that's my immediate goal. Yeah, thanks. I'm just uh, amazed at the uh, intricacies here of yeah. uh, the piping. And you know, we, we don't see that image when you look at the station. No, you don't. Typical shots. This is the hoods up on this thing right now. And actually, uh, let me just tell you, I think that was a shot of Chris Cassidy. I can't. I'm not quite sure because we can't see the stripes that designate them. But where you just saw is called the rat's nest, and you can see why it's called that with all the cabling. It's the junction between the Russian and the U.S. segments. Uh, a lot of communication cables. The cables they're putting out there right now are. are uh, there's several of them for, with several purposes, but I believe that one right there is specifically so that if we have a power failure like we had, uh, or actually a cooling failure that led to a power down like we had at the end of my mission that generated our last emergency spacewalk, 
that if that happens, they have some more redundancy and they can transfer power around in the space station. That's what, that's what they're doing right now. Uh, my name is Jackson Dennis. I'm from Tucson, Arizona. And I was just wondering, how has being in space and being surrounded by the vastness of it changed your perspective on Earth or just life itself? Like, do you have a new, I guess, perspective on everything from being in space? Yeah. It's a, that's a great question, and it's uh, individual for every astronaut because I think it, it uh, does something to what you had as your beliefs and your feeling about the world when you came up. Uh, however, having said that, every astronaut talks about the fact that we don't see any borders while we're up there. You morph you know, from the U.S., and you can tell what the U.S. looks like when you fly over it. You can recognize it right away. You're over the Atlantic Ocean in five to ten minutes, depending on your orbital path, and then suddenly you're in Europe, Eastern Europe, the Middle East. So the unity of human beings, without having seen any borders, any signs, anything like that, is very profound. Not to mention the fact that it's, hum, human beings seem to have a very tenuous grasp, uh, hold on the Earth as well. So it makes you fall in love with the Earth as our uh, humankind's birthplace, with all of its beauty and all of its characteristics. You get to know the Earth really well, almost the personalities of it. Uh, but also the human beings that are very, very precious that are living on it. So you, you get a, you wish heads of state, everybody could come up and see that same view, and I feel like we'd take better care of each other and our Earth if we could see it. Thank you very much. Another question, please. Hi, my name is Joey Barnheisel. I'm from Idaho, and I was just wondering, how do you, physically, you must just train lots, but like mentally and emotionally, that's gotta be a big toll, leaving Earth and going to the vastness. How do you prepare for that? So uh, physically and emotionally for? Mentally and emotionally. Mentally and emotionally for getting into space and for living up there. Um, emotionally, you, you don't really know what to do. What, one thing that, but mentally, there's a lot of things you can do. What uh, NASA does is, first of all, they select people that have done, um, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say risky things, but things that involve calculated risk uh, in their professional lives. So they've accepted it as part of their lives. And then we do have a lot of training trips where we go, go off and uh, do survival training. And say, I, I did survival training on the Continental Divide in February in the state of Wyoming, where it's about 20 below and lots of wind, and we had to go find our food and dig through the snow, that sort of thing. And those are training trips. We learn how to take care of ourselves. That's number one, know how to take care of yourself um, so others don't have to. Uh, number two, realize your limitations, So, because everybody has them and accept them and uh, have other people help you and learn how to help others. Uh, if you get frustrated or scared or, or in pain or something like that, learn how to, how to deal with that. So you develop a lot of tools uh, to work through those psychological issues when we do our training. And, and that's a, a very important part of it. Uh, one aspect is interactions with others, because you're in a tight spot with the same people for a long period of time. And, uh, it's, it's like a family. Uh, when I was up there, as all guys, is like my brothers, and uh, just like any family, there are issues that can come up, small ones usually, but you can learn how to deal with them, put them away, and, uh, or, or figure them out, uh, whatever seems to work best. Uh, we actually had a great time up there together the whole time. There was no, really no friction amongst our crew, uh, and hopefully that's the way every crew can be as they go through this uh, ground-based training. And then the last thing that's important is learning to be separated from those you love, from your family, <clears throat> and from friends. And that's, that's a, a solution that every astronaut has to work out with their families. So uh, there, there are a lot of techniques that NASA is very familiar with. Uh, they've done a lot of research in this area on dealing with that. And so that's an important aspect of it too, getting ready to go. Okay, thank you. But we should mention that your family is here today. Yeah, my wife, Anne, and my daughter, Grace, she's 10. Uh, she spent half of her uh, fourth grade while I was in outer space. Wow. And so she has an interesting perspective on it too. With school kids asking her every day about her dad in space. I don't know if that happened every day, but. <laughs> it's nice to have yeah. you both here. Thank you for being with us. Grace promised to tell us to sit up straight and do some other directions. So we've been watching her <laughs> throughout this uh, just to be sure we're doing the right thing. So thanks, Grace, appreciate that. You've been a big help. Uh, let's go to another question. I am Erin Geiger from Utah. I was wondering, uh, what are the main qualities needed to become an astronaut? Main qualities? Uh, that's a good question because we always, a lot of people have looked at what, is, what makes all astronauts similar, or what's the similarities between them all, and, and they're all quite different. However, they all love to work. They all are passionate about their work. 
uh, and have always loved what they've done. And so that's, I think those are, it's great advice to anybody who wants to be an astronaut, do what you love. That's why we say that, because that's a similarity. Um, all of them are, uh, have fallen in love with some kind of physical activity, some kind of sport as well. They've all fallen in love with something in their professional or, or sports careers that um, involves some level of calculated risk, whether it's flying or working in a submarine or skydiving or something like that. Um, and I say calculated risk, that means being able to plan ahead, understanding your limits, and uh, yes, you're accepting a certain amount of risk, but understanding what you're getting into as opposed to you know, some other crazy stuff. So um, I think that's, that's what makes them, makes them all similar. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hey, we're watching the uh, spacewalk today, uh, live on NASA television, and uh, I think it's streamed on nasa.gov. And our guest is uh, here in the, in the museum, is Dr. Thomas Marshburn, who is the NASA astronaut and the last astronaut to walk in space and return, since Chris now has two, I guess, uh, yep. in this current mission. There he here is right now. Okay. And I believe that is, uh, this is Chris's helmet camera. Can't quite see the, the stripes to identify who's who. But Chris takes a lot of pictures. He's got the camera out right now, taking a picture of, I think that's Luca. So uh, that's Luca. He's wedged himself down in there doing some work. Uh, I hope I'm, I'm not wrong on that, but I believe that is Luca. Uh, because he has, right, he has that suit without the, yeah. without, uh, without yeah, the ground nose for sure. And uh, Luca's adjusting his lights because he's had to wedge himself down into a place that's probably a little bit dark there. And uh, Chris might be giving him some guidance. That big backpack is their life support system. Ah. Scrubs carbon dioxide, contains the water that we need for cooling, and and uh, and uh, contains the oxygen as well. And the, the unit right at the bottom of the pack, that's that emergency uh, right. unit? Right. So you see the box at the bottom, you see those four holes in a vertical row? Uh, there's actually holes all around that, and you see, they call them towers. You see the two extensions that come, it looks like a long L. That is the uh, jet backpack. So that if they get cut free, completely free, then that is their ride back, kind of like a it is a jet, jet pack, too, and we train to do this, to, to fly through the vacuum of space freely right back in there to get back and grab onto the space station again. Go to a question from Carly. Okay. Hi, I'm Carly Lanik from Indiana, and obviously you've talked about how stressful it can be going into, state, or into space, comparing it to taking an exam. Um, I was wondering if there's anything you and other astronauts do to just lighten up that tension in space. I, the most important thing, first of all, is, is competency, getting, being ready, mm -hmm. and that's a lot of homework. And so we, astronauts develop a lot of techniques for getting ready. Um, I know that doesn't lighten things up, but uh, you, you can't get to that point unless you are really ready to go. Um, getting the mindset of putting yourself into that position so that when you get to it, uh, you've covered not only what you got to do, but what you would do if things don't go right, because they almost never do. Mm -hmm. And so you've covered all the bases, you feel confident with it, you know your crewmates well, uh, typically you've trained together. And at that point, uh, while you're all focused on the task, uh, humor is a, is a wonderful way uh, to <laughs> spend the time to work and to, and to lighten the air a little bit. So uh, there will be jokes going back and forth all the time. One thing that uh, I remember very well from my uh, not my last spacewalk, but I've, I've done three with Chris Cassidy, who's out there now. He's got a great sense of humor as well, and he has a daughter named Grace. And, and when we were on our way back, I had the unique opportunity while I was out doing my spacewalk to say hello to my family, because they were in mission control and they were listening in. And so I said, hi, Grace. And so Chris Cassidy said, why did you say hello to my daughter? I said, no, that was my Grace. He said, no, that was my Grace. He said, hello. <laughs> we went back and forth. You know, just a simple little thing like that. We both started laughing. And sometimes you get the giggles and you can't even stop. But um, that's a, it's a great way to, uh, to continue the focus and actually relax your brain for a second so you can continue the focus throughout the work. Okay, I'm just thank amazed, you. you know, that you would be 250 miles up. Yeah. Chance to spin off into space. And there you guys are. Yeah. <laughs> a very real moment like that. Uh, that's just the training and getting ready, I guess. Yeah, yeah you got to be ready first. Yeah, that's for wow. sure. Another question. It's Luca. You can see the Italian it's flag okay, there. Here. Definitely oh, the, Italian the Italian flag, flag there. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Gabby from Illinois. And being such an accomplished astronaut, you've talked to a lot of press and a lot of important people. But be it life changing or really funny, could you tell us one of your fondest memories that you haven't really told a lot of people? Uh, while I was in space, one of my fondest memories. Um, well, I've, I've told a lot of people about most of them. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll uh, 
one of your favorite memories of space, one of the greatest things about flying in space and being an astronaut is who you get to work with. Uh, they're, they're very fine people, but you're also sharing an incredible experience together, and that's multiplied when you share it with someone. Some of the most special moments in space is when you're looking out the window, when you have a few minutes of downtime, and you can look out the window together. And with each one of my crewmates, I've had an opportunity to, to look out the window, and we just happen to cross, come across something absolutely spectacular. And we're not interacting with each other other than the, both of us pointing out uh, what we see, uh, learning from each other, but also just enjoying it together. And with Chris Cassidy and I, we had one of those moments uh, coming across South America. It was very clear over the Andes. You could see um, our orbital path all the way from the Pacific to the Atlantic coming over Patagonia and, and some of the Southern Andes there. Um, and just ooing and aahing about what we could see, taking pictures as fast as we could, pointing things out. And uh, that's, that's a moment that I'll never forget. And uh, it's a real treasure. Thank you. Thanks. Amidst all the technology, it still is very a human experience. Oh, very much so. And that's, that's why we put people up there, so people can uh, talk about it and, and relate it to everybody on the ground. Wow. Another question. Uh, I'm Riley Wallace from Huntsville, Alabama, appropriately. Yeah. So um, I would like to know that um, since this is such a risky venture and there's such a great risk of if something goes wrong, then you, you're in real present danger. When you were initially approached with this opportunity, what was, was there a process of debate in your mind? And if so, how did that go? Uh, not a debate in my mind, because I'd want to be an astronaut my whole life. And so to even get to the point, which the first day of, of uh, interviews, when you're applying to be an astronaut, that's when all that comes up. Uh, so you've gotten, you know you're one of 120 that might be selected to be one of the, in my class, 11 that were selected to be astronauts. So you know you're, you're down to a, to a small group. And they start that, when you come down for your interviews, they start that with a uh, lecture on the risks of spaceflight, just the numbers of how many people have died uh, flying in space or getting ready to fly in space. So it's very clear to you. But at that point, you're so excited to be at that point uh, that you say, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, let's press on. But then, um, when it came for my chance to fly in space, Columbia uh, accident had happened not uh, soon, not too long ago, and so then it really matters with your family. So I had to sit down and talk with my family, and um, fortunately, my my wife and daughter are behind the space program. Typically, the families are of, of people who fly in space, um, and that's when you have a real heart-to-heart -heart discussion about what this means and the kind of risk you're taking. Um, and more, that's as much as an emotional preparation for what's coming up as anything else. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm, I'm Mason Stroll from South Carolina. And I was just wondering, uh, the first time you went into space, uh, what went through your mind when you first felt that real sense of zero gravity? Yeah, the, uh, the real sense of zero gravity hits you like a ton of bricks. It's amazing because the uh, shuttle flight is just a wild, rattling ride. Um, and then as you get close to main engine cutoff, eight and a half minutes after launch, you feel three Gs pressing in into your chest, like a big gorilla sitting on your chest, and it's kind of hard that you're taking your breaths, breath in sips, um, and you just have the, the vibration and the roar of that engine behind you, and then it's just gone like that. At engine cutoff, it, everything stops. The only thing you can hear is a cabin fan that's just circulating the air to, to keep, your, keep your air moving, keep you alive in there. So almost complete silence except for that fan going. And you actually come out of your seat because of the, after having been pressed in the seat, you actually jump out of your seat a little bit, but you've got your seat belts on. Uh, a pencil on a lanyard came out and started spinning around. And you can feel your blood moving up into your head, your organs lifting up just like you're going over the top of a roller coaster. You might have felt that, or in the car going over a hill. Just feel a little woo. You definitely get that feeling right away. Um, and uh, after that, it's just pure magic. It's, it's absolutely delightful to live in zero gravity. And it's your, I, I think it's about as big a change as we must have gone through when we were born, because everything is new. How to eat, how to put on your clothes, and what it feels like, what it looks like. Everything is new. I can't imagine any greater transformation than that, uh, as the same as when you get to main engine cutoff and, and enter outer, outer space. I, I just have to tell you, I uh, unclipped my, um, uh, my seat belts took all those off. My goal was to get up and start taking off my spacesuit. Uh, I did have a, a bag under the seat, so I reached under to, to get the bag under my seat so I could start putting things in it. 
course, my whole body pitched over and found myself completely upside down in exactly the position, position I didn't want to be in. Uh, and that was my first move in zero <laughs> gravity. So it's a little bit hard to stop yourself from tumbling. You have to learn to, to restrain yourself and, and learn to move around. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maddie Green. I'm from here in DC. I was wondering um, if you remember where you were when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, and if so, what kind of impact did that have on your career? That's a, that's a great question. I imagine y'all, there's got to be, um, I'm trying to think of what space event would have been a, a similar one in everybody's life here, or what, what events would have occurred, maybe 9-11, something like that. But uh, for me, I was, uh, it was probably the biggest event of my childhood in terms of its impact. Uh, my parents uh, let us uh, get up and get down into the living room. I know exactly where I was, the, where I was sitting in the living room on the floor with the family watching that grainy black and white television set and, uh, and uh, just in complete wonder. I mean, we didn't know if we were gonna see, I was, I was eight years old, I didn't know if I was gonna see aliens running around or if there were gonna be <laughs> microbes that they were gonna bring back um, to Earth or what was gonna happen, but I knew it was uh, an incredible event that was happening and I don't know why, I. I felt that at, the year, at eight years of age. Um, but, uh, and I would not say that I started on my path to wanting to be an astronaut after that. However, it did feed that quite a bit. And uh, my wonder and fascination of space was very much uh, jump-started by, by watching that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Well, we're just at the start of man's exploration of space, and we're about five hours left, I think, in the spacewalk. But we've yep. come to the end of our time this really? morning here. Although those of you in the Great Hall of News here will continue for a little while longer, but we're going to have to say goodbye to our NASA television audience. And we'd like to thank um, astronaut Thomas Marshburn for being with us this morning, as well as our Free Spirit Scholars. So uh, if you'll join me in thanking Dr. Marshburn. Thanks. Thank you.